Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of In Focus. Today, we're joined by Terry Brown, Head of Engineering. Terry, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming on board. No, it's really nice to, to be here. Thank you. No problem at all. Um, Terry, I'll start how we usually start um, these podcasts. In your opinion, what's the most interesting or exciting thing about working in technology at the minute? Oh, uh, I think we're supposed to say AI, aren't we? We're, that, that's the, <laughs> the sort of hot topic at the minute. But I, it's interesting. I think I think AI is probably getting a little too much attention at the minute. Um, mm. I've seen, you know, I've seen companies focusing in on that almost to try and jump to a different product market fit and things like that and losing sight of getting the basics right um mm. i do think there's a huge opportunity there but it's for me that's not the the most exciting thing i think there's something for me in in how our industry is maturing and and whether you look at um goodness how we're doing cloud operations so the the maturity and security there around things like supply chain and zero trust and, and things like that. Or mm. you look at um, the maturing of our field in the sort of uh, DevOps thinking, you know, the Dora metrics, the space framework, there's there's lots of, of move towards measuring the improvement and understanding where you sit in, in relation to others. I think mm. that's that's the really interesting thing. The The technology, always cool. But I think the maturing of the industry is probably the thing that excites me most at the minute. Good. And I think that, you know, that's something we'll uh, for sure come on to. But for anyone listening that doesn't know um, your background, Terry, just fill us in in terms of a little bit about yourself and um, and sort of your journey to where you are today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm possibly older than many of, <laughs> of your uh, usual audience. So I, my career, goodness, 28 years. And I think probably 50-50 split. So I started as an individual contributor. Um, I've been a, a geek all of my life. So I've written programs all mm. the way through childhood and things as well. Um, I've worked in a lot of different industries. So agency, health tech, health informatics, gambling, um, and different scales as well, and different sizes of org, all the way from small startup to, I mean, global pharma kind of thing. Mm. Um it was about about halfway through that journey, so maybe it's 14 years ago, and I kept getting kind of pushed into management, but um, reluctantly. I liked, I still like solving problems with code. <laughs> um, but I, I got to the point where I was starting to really enjoy helping people solve problems mm -hmm. and not solve mm -hmm. them myself. And that sort of started me on that engineering journey of, of mm -hmm. sort of manage, managing teams. Um, I think I would probably now, I mean, certainly as, as that journey as well, like I'm, I moved maybe five, six years ago into manager of managers type roles. So director, mm -hmm. head of, um, and I'm currently head of engineering at Dockler, but I'm just about to move to uh, a director of engineering role at a sort of hotel property management uh, company called Muse. Mm -hmm. And... I think outside of that, um, I tend to lean towards that sort of small to medium sized company. You know, I like an org that I can actually have some impact in from a culture, from a process perspective. So mm -hmm. maybe it's, you know, the anywhere from 200 to 1,000 kind of company. Um, I've worked in yeah. global enterprise, um, but yeah, smaller companies, I think. Good. And I, I mean, we've known each other for a number of years now, Terry. And, um, you know, every, every time we talk, one of the things that um, is is always and has always been high on your agenda is, and you've mentioned it a couple of times there, is, you know, the culture of workplaces, how people work with one another, how teams work with one another, you know, the, the way we're approaching things as opposed to necessarily what we're doing. Um, I mean, exp expand on that for, for people that haven't had our previous conversations on sort of why you think that is, it sounds like a silly question because we all know it's important, but why is it so important from your perspective? I mean, it's, you know, we work with people. I think um, there was a, a fantastic quote in a book many years ago on, on software engineering. And um, it said, no matter what they tell you, and I'll paraphrase this badly, but no matter what they tell you, it's a people problem. And I, I've seen that so many times in my career, you know, tech, is the really interesting sort of getting the, the product out there. 
But mm. when we think about those sort of three pillars of people, process, and tech, the tech's almost the least important of those. You know, if you've got bad processes, people are going to struggle to deliver value. If you've got a bad culture, you're not going to hear the voices. You're not going to get good dissent. You're not going to get good ideas. So mm -hmm. um, I, those tend to be the pillars I focus a lot more on and, and sort of lean away slightly from the tech. If you solve, as a leader, at least if you solve people in process, then mm -hmm. tech really does take care of itself in most most cases. Yeah. And do you think that is something that more recently... Well, let me rephrase. More recently, we do hear a lot more about cultures and technology, and it means a lot to people. And I don't think that all of a sudden it started to mean a lot to people. But do you think, where's that come from? Is that come from actually people have more choice now? So they're prepared to put up with less of a culture that doesn't fit what they, you know, necessarily sort of believe in or their values? Yeah, I, I think so. I think... Um... There was a brilliant article I read from Harvard Business Review, and it, it was called um, New Power, Old Power. And when you think about, I mean, goodness, when I first started my career 28 years ago, management was management. It was, mm -hmm. you know, telling people to do things. It was, you know, it was messy and people were resources and you didn't really have a lot of choice because everybody was operating like that. Mm -hmm. I think over time there's been this groundswell of change and i think um generationally we have become and, and the article the hbr article talks about this really well we've become people who have purpose you know you can influence on tiktok you can influence in in other ways you mm -hmm. tend to follow causes and to have that sort of voice outside of the workplace and then suddenly come inside the workplace and being told what to do and not to have a voice and things and mm -hmm. I think a lot of organizations that are adapting well to this are doing exactly what we talked about, kind of putting that people in process first and making sure that those people are heard, are listened to, because mm -hmm. you don't just hire people to execute. You know, that's <laughs> that's almost the dull part of what you do. You know, you hire people to come and help you make your products better. And, mm -hmm. and I think those organizations that are probably thriving at the moment have have adapted to this um it's really nice as well i mean the landscape is changing now in terms of the literature so you get thinkers like brené brown simon sinek and i mean goodness mm -hmm. a massive amount of others who are talking about this in a big way and it, it makes such a difference to what people come to expect in the workplace yeah absolutely and from that then how would you define you know what are the key indicators for you of what a great culture is in the workplace or where you may try and, you know, set the, well, that's a separate question in itself. Is it up to you to set the culture, but we'll come on to that in a minute. What are the key indicators of, uh, of, yeah, what a great culture is to you? What, how would you spot it? Oh, that's great. I think um, typically if I would start with leadership, You've got a leadership who's listening. You've got a leadership who is uh, seeking opinion. You've got a leadership who is encouraging safety and dissent. And uh, there's, a, there's a word that gets bandied so much at, at, in, in our space that it's it's lost a little bit of meaning, but psychological safety, you know, creating that ability mm -hmm. for everybody to turn up and have a voice and almost be expected to have a voice, but it being mm -hmm. safe to do so, safe to fail, safe to learn, safe to share ideas. And you would definitely expect to see that, but I think probably more than just see it, you'd expect to see leaders amplifying it. I think mm -hmm. without that, it becomes a, a buzzword that everybody thinks we should have, but nobody's actually doing anything about it. Um, mm -hmm. And there was a great, there was a great share even in the past day from uh, Sarat at Hedgehog Labs. And he, he was talking about, you know, it's not the leader's job to create psychological safety. He's right. It's it's not, but they can go first. It's definitely a group mm -hmm. level thing. And everybody, you know, you and I can have trust, but in a group, we have to feel safe in order to do that at a group level. Um, mm -hmm. And the leader can make that so much safer. So definitely psychological safety. And then you'll you'll see feedback. You know, you'll see people actively giving each other feedback. That's a really good sign of a good, healthy culture, like an open mm -hmm. uh, culture and defaulting to open in all things like communication, being clear about 
you know, the simple stuff that you would expect to be table stakes, like, you know, strategy and direction of the company. You want to see everybody know everything yeah. about that for sure. So, yeah, those are yeah. some of the things. Okay, that's interesting. And you mentioned a really great point there about, you know, the, the overuse of certain terms. The, I'm going to say these days. Um, but the overuse of certain terms where actually you're trying to do all of it, but it becomes meaningless. Where's the balance that you strike or how do you ensure that actually you're one picking the right things to focus on of all of the things that are out there at the minute that are, you know, could be classed as hot topics. Um, and then how do you make sure that they are meaningful and not just you know, paying lip service to something because people expect you to have something about psychological safety, to have something about DE and I, to have something, you know, yeah. and those elements yeah. of it. I think, I think you have to have champions. You you have to have people willing to stand up and and lead on these things. And it's um, there's a, a brilliant book um, by Patrick Glencioni called Five Dysfunctions of the Team, and he. He shows a, a kind of hierarchy, almost sort of like Maslow, but he starts at the bottom with trust, which at a group level we can think of as psychological safety. And you can't mm. really get to the top of the pyramid, which for him is results. You can't get there without solving for the other elements of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. So those leaders who are doing this are actively living it as well. You know, what, what are you doing? Are you measuring this? How are you measuring trust? Or okay wh where do we score how are the team feeling what's the what's the mm -hmm. temperature and then what are we going to do about it um and as a leader in the past i've taken that measurement and and you know typically with teams you'd do it maybe once a quarter but then we'd start doing like culture experiments so okay we didn't score highly on conflict you know healthy conflict because it's essential um, mm. what are we going to do about that as a team what could we do in the next quarter to try and improve how we feel about that and it's it's about turning the things into action because everybody mm -hmm. will quickly become disheartened and disillusioned if all you're doing is using the terms but it's it's about turning that into action and as a leader like in real terms we don't add any value you know we're not the ones writing code we're not the ones delivering mm. data sets anything like that our job is to amplify what those people who are delivering value is doing. So in real terms, my job is to take those, those measurements, take that team temperature. How can I help? How can I make it better? How can I help that team become the best version of themselves so they can turn up every day and do good work um, mm -hmm. and feel mm -hmm. like they want to come here and do good work? Kind of thing. Yeah, and that's, um, and that's really interesting because there's a lot of organizations that may still be in a you know their kpis set of kpis as a leader you may want to monitor may still only be results based but actually yeah. you know what you're saying is you need to monitor all of the stuff that goes around it to get to the results because the results are meaningless unless you can figure out sort of how you got there um and what that team temperature is doing what causes it to go up what causes it to go down are you in high yeah. performance are you not and that sort of element of it Abs I mean, goodness, maybe 10 years ago, we were measuring things like velocity, um, which <laughs> I'm opinionated on, but you know, <laughs> you would measure how teams got to value and how consistently they could do it. Um, mm. But we routinely weren't measuring how that felt or indeed those other factors that influenced it, as you said. So mm -hmm. all it is really is taking some of the measurement like that expanding it a little and looking at the you know the the socio-technical the the human factors within that and saying okay what what's making a difference here um mm -hmm. and we all know and and whether we're talking about dei or whether we're talking about just best outcomes um hearing voices is important um mm -hmm. and not just our own voices hearing voices from a range of experiences super super important and it generates better outcomes there's so much evidence for this now mm -hmm. so what are we going to do about that well okay as a leader my job is to dig into that and try and understand that so i can help the team get better and help the team in either a one-to-one -one context and understand what that feels like or in a group context so that mm -hmm. I can help them get to better and more predictable outcomes for the business. 
Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, once once I suppose you've got that nailed, you can move on to what we've talked about before, which is um, if you can expand on, you know, high performance culture, but then using that to combat a leader's possibly biggest problem, which is attraction and retention in the workforce um, and sort of how that can then be used. Well, it's either going to positively affect that or it's going to negatively affect that. But this starts off with maybe what you would class as like, you know, high performance culture and how do you get there? That's a big one. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, there's definitely like we talked about them a little bit earlier on, like uh, the measurement frameworks, like the Dora metrics, you know, mm. lead time, you know, um, mean time to recovery, things like that. So there are measurements that seem to be broadly applicable to our industry. Uh, mm. and, and Dora would indicate, um, you know, if you're doing this sort of pattern, like if you're deploying multiple times uh, per week, if you're, you know, automatically testing, if you are, your mean time to recovery is low and all of that sort of thing, you're a high performing org, you're a high performing mm. team. So you you take that sort of quantitative and then you pull it in with other qualitative and you've got um, like Google, Google did a study mm around what makes a high performing team and of course there were a number of measures in there like you know they were um they had all the context of the org they could make effective decisions um they had effective management in place but top amongst them was again psychological safety and and being able to rely upon each other as a team mm. um because nothing we do in tech is an individual sport anymore certainly when you're you're delivering effective engineering or effective product solutions mm -hmm. always it's cross functional um in some sense typically you know at its simplest you might be pairing with somebody in its most complex there's there's cross dependencies with other parts of the org as well so mm -hmm. having that basis of the the human factors as well, huge. Um, and then, you know, it's really heartening to see some of the simple things that happen. Like at uh, when I was at GSK, we set up a tech blog for the the, the tech org. Um, the amount of times I heard an interview that people had read the tech blog and that was a draw as well. Mm. So anything you can do within the org, I guess you're not necessarily creating a high performing team so much as a high performing culture. And people mm -hmm. see it from the outside, you know, those those people who have influenced on TikTok or who have a purpose will see what mm -hmm. you're doing and, and it, it'll either relate to them or it won't, but it, it yeah. did relate and, and, you know, you can do things like that as well. Yeah, that's that's great. And do you find that um, because people are more involved in that and they feel part of this, you know, high performing culture or this high performing team that it really, you know, can you track that back to your retention sort of statistics over time that actually we've had notably low churn in environments where you have this versus where you don't? Yeah, yeah, you absolutely can. And I think even in organisations where, um, you are, for whatever reason, struggling to deliver technical value. You mm. find that those other aspects that are in place, a good culture, a good technical, uh, good technical rigor, good technical culture, they hugely influence how long you can keep those people for while you perhaps mm. going through those, any sort of struggles around delivery and things. So it's, mm -hmm. yeah, throughout my whole career, I found it makes a massive difference. And it's it's my sort of default now of how can I create the environment rather than how can I get that team to delivery? Like delivery is the outcome rather than the goal. Yeah, absolutely. And do you do you think the there's a you know a, a size limit or a um, you know an, a, an ideal sort of size of team to do this with? where you know you can maximize your results. For for example, I'll use some extreme cases. You know, if you've got a team of ten it's going to be much, much easier possibly to do than if you have a team of 100 people that you're trying to do this from scratch with. But where would you sort of start to change the approach when the team gets over a certain number, you know? Yeah, no, that's it's, it's a great shout. And and there's that sort of famous um, Amazon line of two pizza teams, which for me, 
uh, I like to hire greedy people, so about <laughs> six people at the most. Um, and you are looking at smaller teams, definitely. Obviously, you've mm. got to scale that out across an organization, but yeah, typically leaning on a smaller team, you know, cross-functional, of course, but um, a smaller team. And I think that's the sort of starting point. As you start to scale out, it then becomes, well, how are those managers supporting? Because mm. um, there's a, a, again, Amy Edmondson had a famous quote and she talked about the biggest influencer to how we feel about work to, and, and psychological safety is the nearest mm. manager. So if you and I are managing in an org, but you're managing in the way we've been talking about and I'm an autocratic dictator that's telling everybody what to do, well, mm. those teams are going to have very, very different uh, temperatures. They're going to have very different feels. And I'm typically going to be breaking the culture of the org. Now, it mm. might work. It might get delivery short term and things like that. But ultimately, one of those is probably right for the business. And I, I hope it's, you know, would be your style rather than mine kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you have to have leaders live this all the way up through the the, the food chain. You know, if you've got a CTO who's not living this or you've got a CEO who's not living this, it almost doesn't matter what you do at a local level. You can create yeah. psychological safety at a group level. You can create high performing culture at a group level. But if you're always sort of trying to push up on that, you're, you're always yeah. going to have that unnecessary friction. Yeah, absolutely. And, and is this what people mean when they talk about operationalizing the culture? exactly that yeah. yeah yeah it's um you know if i had any advice for for people i guess listening who were individual contributors you can start today like you don't need to do anything other than just talk to your team ideally you've got a manager who is listening um because you can start small you can start with well two people but you can start with mm -hmm. a small team um but how do you then make sure that carries across to that team over there that you've got to interact with every day or indeed to your boss's boss kind of thing? And that's when it starts to get harder. Um, mm -hmm. And titles can make a huge difference. They shouldn't, but they, they absolutely can. So mm -hmm. that's where it's, it's, you know, the challenge of operationalizing is it has to be both bottom up and top down. You can't, one without the other just won't work. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great shout. Um, and you said uh, something to loop back on. You mentioned in your intro about um, the the sort of um, what was interesting in tech at the minute and the sort of different approaches being taken. Um, we've touched on this before in conversations between ourselves about, um, you know, there's a recent, recent-ish, I suppose you would say, you know, inception of the platform team, which previously wasn't a thing although people were doing those jobs under different guises probably under different job titles that type yeah. of thing do you think this is something that you know is here to stay for a while or do you think this is a stepping stone to a different way of working because one thing I've noticed certainly in the line of work that I'm in I get a lot of insight when a lot of people are hiring and we're doing this and we're doing this and I think the rate of change over the years has increased like and it keeps increasing so change is coming in shorter increments but is that you know almost unsettling to people that are still maybe less established in their careers that don't really know well do I want to put all my eggs in the platform engineering basket because that might not exist as a role in two years time it's that's a brilliant question and I guess um for anybody listening who who hasn't really come across um platform as a role it's we're great in tech of renaming things. Um, so if I look back 12 years and I'm thinking slightly pre devopsy you know, we had dev and we had ops and ops yeah. did your infrastructure. Typically it was um, through what we call click ops. So, you know, they're clicking into Amazon or GCP and, and sort of standing up infrastructure. Um, that matured massively when um all of the early conversations around devops started um mm. but I, i'm opinionated about devops as a job but devops as a mindset is you know about how do we bridge the gap because we used to throw it over the wall from dev to ops so how do we bridge the gap and bring those two together 
Mm. And then there is a maturing of skill sets there. So infrastructure is code. So you're kind of creating repeatable, you know, cloud platforms and things. I think platform is just in some ways a natural sort of maturing of that. So people worried about, well, should I jump to platform or should I look for the next thing? All of the things in platform are probably true in the DevOps mindset. You know, it's mm. repeatable infrastructure, testable infrastructure, things like zero trust, things like securing the supply chain. You know, there's lots of that. Mm -hmm. But typically with platform, you have a almost an as a service type team. Um, and there's a brilliant book on this, if anybody's interested in reading, called Team Topologies, which talks about some of these, these patterns. But mm. platform and engineering, or as, as I name the teams in any org where I'm standing them up, platform enablement is about how do we accelerate builder teams? And that's typically the software engineers so that can stand up safe, secure infrastructure. They are accelerated in all of that. They've got security and repositories and environments out of the box. And mm -hmm. realistically, how do they go from that idea they had into a safe production environment in as short a space of time as possible. And mm -hmm. 10 years ago, that might have been weeks, if not months. And realistically now with, with those teams, you're looking at minutes. You know, that's the aim. It's to try yeah. and reduce that feedback loop and help teams move quickly. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, platform is just a maturing of probably what we've already been talking about in our industry for 10 years with DevOps, with SRE, with, you know, with other yeah. elements of that pipeline. I think it's just a maturing around it being a service and being a provision. And it's, you know, it's very much co-creation with teams, but it's, it's about enabling teams for sure. Yeah, and it's interesting because, um, you know, you, you could take a similar view with things like, you know, the big, uh, we mentioned it at the start, AI is obviously still a big buzzword that's being banded around, but it's it's not necessarily new, is it, um, in terms of what, what, what it does, it's just the capability of some of these models has got better. But for example, like um, teams using GitHub Copilot, it's just shortening the time from getting from one place to another where previously they probably searched Google and Stack Overflow for the answers. Now they'll get a short time, probably get roughly the right answer, still have to check it, still have to implement it and put it in. But it's not necessarily, you know, the big revolution that uh, that we're all talking about at the minute. Yeah, and it is, it's maturing for sure. I mean, some of the, um, uh, you know, the large language models like ChatGPT and, and, and Bard and others mm. are phenomenal um you know when you look at what they are capable of now and i i use them day to day in my job um and i use them in a way of like i'm data protection officer i use them for wording on things like that it's super powerful um they will mature massively over the next five years and i think mm -hmm. they will definitely help certainly our space certainly tech as a space and, and delivery mm -hmm. as a space they they can't fail to, as you say, you know, things like Copilot, although it's erroneous at times and you probably need to know the right answer so you can move faster. In real terms, mm. it's definitely a, a, an opportunity to accelerate what we're doing at the minute. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you think that's the space where, you know, the biggest change will be in the next five years? I usually have this question, what's the next? you know what's the next five years going to hold but that now actually seems like a very long time in technology change sort of world because it could be totally different in five years time but you know in the coming years do you think that's where we'll see sort of the biggest changes in our in our day-to-day -day working lives in technology i think so yeah i i you know generative ai um large language models for sure I really quite like some of the work that's going on at the moment in um, augmented or, or virtual reality as well. Um, mm. You know, if I think about the job I was doing in Dockler where, you know, it's a virtual ward and patients are at home, but they are monitored, you know, what additional comfort could you give a patient if the, the consultant was virtually in the home with them when they were having those back to forth conversations kind of thing? 
So mm -hmm. we'd love to see some investment again in the human factors of what can be achieved with like augmented and, and virtual reality as well. Um, but yeah, both of those spaces are, they're only just, you know, tip of the iceberg kind of thing. So it's, it's be really interesting to see what happens with both of those in the next five years. Yeah, and it's a good shout on the um, the VR AR stuff because um, I remember when that was first a thing, you could get a I forget the name of the app, but it was this um, it was this map where you could use it on your iPhone. If you held it up around you, it'd tell you what was around you, like on a map. And it was a bit dodgy in the like you know buggy that type of stuff didn't really work. By the time you'd spun around, it'd take about thirty seconds to follow you, that type of thing. Um, and it was only recently, um, so my other half uh, kindly bashed our car somewhere. So that's in for repair, and we've got a yeah, we've got a um, we've got a hire car, um, and it's a BMW. And I've not driven that particular car before. It's one of the electric ones that they do. It's very new. Right. But I put the navigation on. It was quite unnerving to start with, but when you're going round a corner or around a roundabout you get on the screen a massive view of what's in front of you, which in itself is weird because you're looking at what's in front of you. But there's these floating arrows and almost like you'd see like on an F1 wow. track, these like things going round, pointing you as you're driving, this is where you need to go. And actually it was spot on as well. So I don't know how much of that is reading what it's seeing versus what's on the map and that type of stuff. But it was super accurate. Once you get over the initial oh, this is different. Um, it was very, very useful to have in places that you've never been before. And I think yeah. that's a, a thing that people are getting more used to with the adoption of some of this stuff. It's getting easier for us, or me personally, to get on board with a technology like that, and it just becomes second nature. Yeah, But that yeah, might be that, because so. of everything else around us at the minute is, is changing so rapidly. I, and I think we are getting... I think because, as you said earlier, you know, the pace of change, I think we are getting better at adapting to some of that change as well, especially in that same space. Um, so, yes, when you, as you said, when you first got in the car, it probably felt jarring, but suddenly mm. it was like, I never want to drive a car that doesn't do this in the future. Yeah. Um, and it's it's surprising how quickly we adapt to just little things that help us with our day-to-day -day lives, for sure. Um, mm. So I would, I would love to see more done in that space, and I think the next five years that the technology is definitely going to be possible to do so. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It'll be an interesting next five years, anyway. But um, but yeah, I'll go. Um, I'll go through some. Uh, well, I say quick fire. I'll ask them quickly. You don't have to answer them quickly. <laughs> um, some quick fire questions for you, Terry, that I ask everyone. And um, if you mm -hmm. end up doing some hiring in your new role, it could be insightful for some people wanting to work there as well that um, are maybe listening. But when hiring for your team, you know what? What are the things that you look for? What makes a great interview, and you know it's going to be a great hire versus not? I think. For me, I definitely look at the the human skills. Um, it's absolutely critical that I can see evidence, the growth mindset. Um, mm. I, you know, anybody who who would come to a, a role in tech with a fixed mindset is probably going to struggle at some point in their career. So, seeing it evidenced in some way, and I, I would typically ask questions around that to try and eke that out. Mm. And I do possibly overvalue the the human the the you know what it's like to talk to that person um i always temper that with um the you know i am a massive fan of of creating diverse workforces so i recognize in you know over laboring the human factors i can probably under labor some neurodiversity and, and, and non-neurotypical um mm. so I, I need to be careful with that but certainly um, growth mindset and then human skills because tech can be learned you know if you've got a growth mindset tech can easily be learned and adapted mm -hmm. absolutely and on that um building for you know diverse teams do you or how do you try and ensure that everywhere you know you're a leader at terry how, how are you sort of building in these elements of making sure that we are fit for for diversity should those people want to work here I mean, the easiest way is just to adapt your hiring process based on what a person needs. Um, mm. So we have a fairly typical funnel, but we adapt that based on 
you know, anything that that person needs. So, you know, a take home test, for example, you would look to see how that person can fit something like that in. But if they don't have time to do a take home test, but they can show us something on GitHub, there's like there's lots of different ways of adapting that. And I think mm -hmm. the the you know, if you have a hiring process that's one size fits all, you're probably going to get a one size fits all team as well. So it's mm -hmm. it's making sure that you adapt throughout that whole process, I think, um, because everybody is different and everybody has entirely different needs. Absolutely. And yeah, you know what, that's a great point about adapting the hiring process, because actually people can say that they are as welcoming and, you know, it's it's one team here and we've got a great culture as much as you want. But if you then aren't accommodating through your hiring process, that's the first signal for somebody that doesn't even work at your organization yet. Well, what's this working relationship going to be like? And that's another way, you know, when we're talking about how some of these internal things can improve attraction um, in the recruitment process, that can often be the first thing. It's like, well, take it or leave it. This is our three-stage process with a take-home tech test that takes four hours and we don't change it for anyone. Uh, but on the flip side, you're showing them a job spec that says you're a caring and flexible and exactly. this and that employer, um, you know, so I often think that one does get overlooked a little bit, um, yeah, but it's great. Future. It's great that you've got those in there. Yeah. hundred no, percent. Um, and then I suppose final question from me, Terry, and this is always a bit of a big one and uh, feel free to give more than one if you've got more than one, but in, in your you know career, what do you think the best piece of advice you've, you've ever received is? Um, uh, the, there's one, there's one that sticks out for me because it's the one that I try and run my career by now. And it was, um, it was a quote given me like when I was earlier in my mm. tech career, goodness, I was difficult to work with. Um, I, <laughs> I was definitely not emotionally intelligent. I certainly felt like I lacked empathy. So I used to have quite, you know, high friction interactions with those outside my teams. And mm -hmm. um, I was lucky, very lucky at the time to have like an informal mentor. It was a friend, but they, they were mentoring me as well. And mm -hmm. A, they gave me very, very direct feedback about what an ass I was being. Um, <laughs> but they gave me a, a Maya Angelou quote as well. And it just, it sticks to me to this day. It's on my website. It's it's how I try to, to kind of live my career. So it's, you know, people will forget what you said. People for, will forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Mm. And as a leader, like that's not just about being nice, of course. I mean, niceness doesn't get results, but how you make people feel is the foundation for how you get to high performance as well. So that was possibly some of the best and indeed timeliest feedback I ever had. I think my management career was on a an interestingly different path at the time until mm. I got that. And it, it sent me on a sort of reflection spiral, really. But um, it made such a difference to my life, really, let alone just how I lead. Yeah, no, that's great. And it, it, it's a very timeless quote as well, because, you know, as long as long as people do this job, it's the the human connection that you make with people or don't make with people that'll drive absolutely everything. And it's um yeah. the, you know the phrase what do they call it uh, effective presence. And you know are are you in that conversation to be in that conversation or have you already thought well I need these three things out of this conversation so that's always in my mind and I'm not really bothered about the person I'm in the you know in the zone with. Um, yeah. But no, that's yeah. great. It makes such a difference to career. I mean, if I think about the last three jobs I've had, I've had people follow mm -hmm. me. Um, and I know they're great at what they do because I've worked with them, but they've thankfully um, willingly followed me to to other orgs. It's, it makes such a massive difference to how you create that that culture going forward as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Sari, for your time. It's been fantastic talking to you. Um, and and to hopefully... Them. Hopefully see you again soon in person. But um, but yeah, we'll post links to any articles, anything you've mentioned um, underneath the video. And, um, and yeah, nothing else to say other than thank you. Yeah, no, thanks. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Cheers, Terry.